like they say, oh, static stretching takes away power output, but it does come back after a while, right? Yeah. Yep. That's why. Good morning, happy Friday. I have no coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Kind of a weird Friday, kind of a busy Friday. Got to dig right into today's Q and A. Um, this is another segment that I did with uh, with Drew Keel uh, from the QB Docs. This was actually not part of the podcast. Actually, this was an extra conversation that we had, and we said, "Hey, you know, this is really good stuff. Let's just record it." And so we started started talking about <clears throat> um, yielding actions and and how they actually work. And then we used throwing as a context. So Drew's a quarterback uh, coach, and so. Um, it made sense to, to take this um, into his realm. So you get a little bit of a context so you can kind of see how this actually works um, in, in that framing. Um, very, very useful conversation, I think, because I don't think a lot of people understand how these connective tissue behaviors actually work and how important they are. Um, this is where all of this velocity and power output is gonna be coming from. And so we actually talk about that a little bit. We also talk about the influence of static stretching on connective tissues and why you see the behaviors that you do in the literature. So again, very, very useful. Um, if you would like to participate in a 15-minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. We will arrange that at our mutual convenience. Don't forget to put 15-minute consult in the subject line so I don't delete it. Uh, podcast will be up on Sunday per usual. Everybody have an outstanding weekend, and I will see you next week. We're talking about yielding. Yeah. Okay. And I always talk about rate because um, it's, it's one of the easier ones to see represented, and then we can talk about the why, okay? So um, when I move quickly, when I move quickly, um, so it's, it's a higher rate of loading on connective tissues, the connective tissues behave more stiffly, right? When I apply a force over an extended period, then the soft tissues gradually give away and, and store energy. So we're unkinking the, the collagen fibers, right? When we're, when we're yielding, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so under, under those circumstances, you unkink them, they store energy, and then they want to respond by returning to, to, their, to their previous structure. So, you know, rubber band's a good representation. Right? We can use that. Um, and, but um, when, we, when we talk about the why, okay, so um, connective tissues are, are surrounded by and, and imbibed with the waters, right? So, the, you know, um, collagen fibers are just surrounded by. Um, and so when, when you pull on a connective tissue very, very quickly, there's not enough time for the water to escape. So that's why the tissue behaves very stiffly. So water's incompressible, you squeeze it and, it, and it doesn't move. But if I do it over a long period of time, there's plenty of time for the water to get squeezed out. That's why we see the two differences in behavior, especially with rate, rate dependent behaviors, okay. right? But now you have to say, it's like, okay, well, what context am I asking for this yield to occur? Is it very, very quick? Or is it something that I can do under a, a, a circumstance where I can apply a load over a longer period of time? So, um, so uh, you ever read those studies where it says static stretching reduces power output? Yes. Okay. Well, why does that happen? Because that rate change, it's already that the, the rate on the, on the soft, the connective tissue is already expanded. So you don't have that contractile ability to, to overcome. Okay. So, so static stretching addresses one end of the yield and overcome relationship right? So if I take a rubber band and I pull it back, that's a yield. If I pull it back and I release it very quickly, it snaps back. So that's the overcome, all right? But understanding how connective tissue behavior works is that when I yield, if I, so if I, if I hold the static stretch long enough, I squeeze the water for out from the outside and then it slowly comes back into shape like a stretch Armstrong, you know what I'm talking about? The, the toy, right? Okay. And it slowly comes back into shape as the water that got squeezed out goes back into the tissues. So until that water goes back in, I have this yielded tissue that won't snap back. So it will not overcome fast enough. So the power output that's associated with, with movement is the stretch and release element of connective tissues. Yes. But I got a situation where I pulled it so long, I squeezed enough water out of it that it just takes more time for the water to go back into the tissues. So the tissue behavior comes, goes back to normal. And if you, if you read, the, read the studies, like they say, oh, static stretching takes away power output, but it does come back after a while, right? Yeah. Yep. That's why. 
Okay. That's why it comes back is because we restored the initial starting conditions, but that's why static stretching doesn't enhance power is because of, of the way that you're applying the yielding action does not allow the overcome to occur quick enough. Gotcha. Gotcha. So okay. if I was trying to drive yielding in a specific area. Could I just make the movement slower in essence? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You can, but you gotta, you have to understand. It's like, okay, how long am I doing it for? Um, do, am I, am I trying to create a situation where I'm storing and releasing energy? Yeah. Okay. Or am I just trying to create a, a buffer to end range of motion, which would be something that might be useful in a static stretching kind of a situation. Gotcha. Gotcha. So for, I'm just going to give an example just for context, right? Mm -hmm. So if I have an athlete that, well, let's say quarterback, right? If I have a quarterback taking his drop and he goes into that transfer of that weight on that right foot, he can't get, he can't transfer that weight very well uh, during his, during that, that phase of the motion to, you know, yeah. use the force. Yeah. Would it, would it be, it would be beneficial for me to first teach him how to yield better on that side without the, the force going forward, right? Because okay. if, I, if I teach him how to overcome with that initially, it's just going to drive the overcoming. Yeah. I'm never, I'm never well, he has, to, he has to compensate. He has to compensate. He has to compensate. Yeah. So, so, so here's the description that you just gave me, okay? Um, if you were gonna, if you were gonna try to put, put some some force behind a throw, so you're just standing out on the field, okay? And I know you've done this like a, a gajillion times. Every time you want to like like put some air under the ball, right? So you you sort of walk into it, right? Yeah. So you step forward with your right foot, then your left foot, and then you throw, right? Yeah. It's not like when you're in the in a pocket and you and you, and you've already planted your foot. You sort of step into it. Well, why do you step into it? It's because you're, you're creating, you're, you're landing in an early propulsive representation on the right foot. You move through middle, you go to max, you step into the other side, and now you've stepped into this with a tremendous amount of stored momentum. Wow. Now you do the exact same thing on the left foot, and now you can translate that momentum into the ball, and then that's demonstrated as velocity, right? And then that's, that's why, why you why throw crow hop? Is that why outfitters crow hop whenever they, like for, on their throws? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. But now let's, so let's, let's, let's take a, uh, let's take a scenario. You're going to do the exact same thing. Okay. But this time when you step forward, so the early representation um, would, would be, let's just say you can't capture the early. So you can't get your, you can't get your big toe down to the ground. Okay. So you're going to stay in a supinated foot representation, but you still got to make the throw. What you're going to have to do is then you have to, you have to compensate for the lack of the ability to go to middle propulsion or max propulsion in the throw. So you're going to do it in a different way. So now you're going to have to create an orientation because I got to get up and over that foot. So I don't have the dorsiflexion anymore, but I got to get over the foot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift up and I'm going to go over it and I'm going to tilt my pelvis forward and down to create the downforce to get to the other foot. But now I've altered the, I've altered the, the timing of the throw. And so now my accuracy is going to be compromised. So it's not that you can't produce the force. It's just that you're not going to do it in, in a manner where you have the relative motions available to you where you can produce a consistent release point. So this is why the, the, the release points get in. You know, all you gotta do is they, they'll, they'll do like a, in baseball, they do a, they do a plot where they can capture release points, then they can measure it on, on coordinates, right? So they can always tell where the, the release point is. You see these nice smooth plots that are on a, like a best foot line versus like a scattering that's all over the place. So you got a guy that doesn't have access to even the, the normal ankle mobility, doesn't mean he can't throw, it just means that his accuracy might be compromised or, or you're probably gonna see the onset of, of these little aches and pains that start to show up because he's got to use compensatory strategies, which are compressive, right? So maybe he compresses at the elbow, maybe he compresses at the shoulder, maybe he compresses at the hip, maybe he uses his lower back, maybe he uses his neck, right? However it might be to, to create these throws. 